This message was given by Matt Harima at Campus Fellowship's Fall Conference 2022. The theme of the conference was the greatest story ever told, a look at how the Bible is one coherent story. We hope you find this encouraging. My name is Matt. Um, I am a pastor in Ames, Iowa. I've been in Ames for 24 years now. I've been a Christian for most of those years. I got involved with a, with a Bible study at, out of... Um, Stonebrook Community Church, which is where uh, CF Ames is housed right now. I have a family. I've got four beautiful daughters and a beautiful wife, Nancy, who actually, she and I went to high school together. That is us shortly after flying the Millennium Falcon, which was one of the highlights of my life, by the way. (laughs) This was in November, and uh, it was like literally on my birthday. We didn't plan it this way. Uh, You know, we we got to finally take the girls to Disney World. That's a thing that every parent is obligated to do at some point in their life, apparently. This music stand hates me. It's consistently getting lower. (laughs) What was that? Turn the thing? Look at that. No, 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 no. We'll see. So we finally got to take them, and by sheer coincidence, on the day that was my birthday, we got to fly the Millennium Falcon. So I got to fly the Millennium Falcon for my 42nd birthday. That was pretty epic. Um... So that's cool. I've, I've been, yeah, I've been around, I've been a Christian for 22 years, been a pastor for nine of those years. I've known a lot of you since you were, a lot of you from Ames I've known since you were wee little children, and that's been kind of fun. And as I, I said, I was doing it during soundcheck, this sort of thing makes me feel my age, because I came up as a Christian uh, in events like this. For the last 22 years of my life, I've been going to retreats like this to learn about the scriptures. I've been going to other events and things. So it's just good to be able to be up here on stage. I remember being in your age on the seat and feeling a call of God in my life to do something for him. And I thought, man, it'd be really cool if I could be a conference speaker someday. Um, Turns out it's a lot of work. Uh, and it's hard, and it's nerve-wracking, and it's not as all that. You know, so if you're out there thinking, man, I'd love to be a conference speaker someday, just be careful what you wish for. That's all I'm saying. But I'm really excited for this opportunity. Like Jacob said, I'm a, I'm a big picture guy, um, and I love the Bible. It's the best book on the planet. It's the most important book on the planet. It's actually, it's actually not just one book. And so for those of you who are familiar with this book, who have one in your hands, have you ever given much thought to how this all fits together. Like, what is this? Um, I'll say, if, you, if you're studying the Bible, it, it, over the course of your life, it's really helpful to ask the question, what am I even looking at here? What even is this? And think about that critically. Um, some of you were raised in the church, were raised in Sunday school, and have certain presuppositions about the Bible. Some of those presuppositions you're going to find out over time are actually wrong. Um, And so if some of you go off to a secular university like I did, like at Iowa State University, you're going to have your professors tell you, hey, everything you learned about the Bible was wrong. Here's an example. And they'll point to something that you were incorrectly taught growing up, and they'll say, see, that's wrong, and they will be correct because you were taught incorrectly. And then they will say, see, the whole thing's wrong, which is not true. Uh, In fact, the whole thing's correct. You were just taught incorrectly. But they'll be able to point to weaknesses. And so it's really important to study your Bible and ask good questions about it and ask good questions, what even am I looking at? Um, Some of you know this book is actually 66 books. The word Bible actually is is not, is is a better word for, uh, like a better word for it is like library, not really book. But Bible means more like library. It's 66 books written by about 40 different people over the course of 1,500 years in three different languages. That's a lot of disparity. Even the kinds of people that wrote it, you have people all the way from the highest prophets ever to walk the face of the earth, all the way down to farmers uh, and everywhere in between. These 40 different people that wrote the Bible came from all walks of life. And I know that many of you have been taught that this Bible tells one story, but how does it do that? How is it possible that 66 very different books tell one story? When you look at this book, how do you perceive the stories fitting together? Have you ever given that any thought? I actually asked my wife. We've been married for coming up on 20 years. We dated for six years prior to that. I don't recommend dating for six years. Lots of problems happen. Just hang out and be friends and stuff. But I asked her, have you ever, like, this is the thing... I told her, I'm thinking of starting the conference with this question. Have you ever given any thought? How do you you perceive the way this fits together? 
And she goes, hi, I don't think I've ever given that any thought. Uh, is it just a random collection of different stories that, uh, that are they're all about the same kind of thing? They're all about people interacting with God. So that's why they're in the Bible. But there's just random stories. And, and from these stories, we can pull general truths about God and about ourselves and how we're supposed to, um, how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to relate to him. And, and we can apply things from that. But they're just, it's just a bunch of random collections of stories. It's like somebody took a bunch of essays and duct taped them together uh, along a spine. And that's what we have. It's just kind of this collection of random books. Or if you do believe that it tells one coherent story, I mean, how do you account for the fact that this, was, this one coherent story was told by 40 different people over the course of 1,500 years in three different languages. And, and, and I want you to be able to answer that question beyond, well, God helped them to do it, which is true. But how did he help them do it? How did he have them? It's, it's not just that they didn't know what they were doing in it just by random circumstance or by the provident hand, the invisible provident hand of God, these things all mir miraculously fit together. And it's not even like a chapter book. You, you know this. If you look at what we're holding here, it's not even like a chapter book. It's not even like a series, like Harry Potter or, you know, like um, uh, The Wheel of Time or uh, Percy Jackson or name your favorite, like, anthology of books. It's more like a library, I said earlier. That's what the Bible, the word Bible kind of means, library. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of things in here. There's histories. There's history books. There's poetry right in the middle and actually scattered throughout. There's a bunch of proverbs in here, proverbial sayings, kind of like, oh, I mean, a lot of different religions and a lot of different cultures have proverbs, and we have ours. There's personal letters, like we get to read to some, from some dude named Paul to some dude named Timothy, and somehow that applies to our life. And there's narratives. There's narratives in here, some of them which read like history books, and some of them which read like they're recounting actual facts, and some of them, like Job, seem like they're telling once upon a time in a faraway land type of stories and yet this all fits together. How? How does this all fit together? I think if you, if you grew up growing, going to Sunday school, or maybe if you didn't go to Sunday school, but you've read the Bible through once or twice, you might recognize and be familiar with some of the bigger stories. Some of the bigger stories are like Adam and Eve in creation, right? And then the whole thing with the snake and the apple. Um, you might be familiar with the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. And if you grew up in the era I grew up in, you have annoying little songs that won't leave your head. The Lord said to Noah to build him an arky, arky. Lord said to Noah to build him an arky, arky. Make it out of hickory, barky, barky, children of the Lord. And now that's all in your heads. You're welcome. You might be familiar with the story of Abram being called by God and becoming the father of many nations. You might be familiar with the story of Moses and the Exodus and the seven or the, the plagues, the plagues on uh, on Egypt and the Ten Commandments and the tablets and that thing with the golden cow. You might be familiar with David and Goliath, or King, you know, King David and all of his exploits, and the fact that he played the harp and he wrote lots of songs. And I hope you're at least passingly familiar with the story of Jesus and the things he taught. But how do these stories flow together? Do they? Or are they all just random different pieces of information? Other than the fact that they're simply in our Bible and they're about God and they're about people. And maybe even beyond that, we have like, you realize like we have two major sections of this book. We have the Old Testament, which takes up most of it. And then we have the New Testament, which takes up less of it. Right about here. Why is it called the Old Testament? Why is it called the New Testament? And what are we supposed to do about that? I mean, my, my guess, if you were like me when I was your age, which I hope you're not, <laughs> um, I hope you're way more mature and smart and wise and settled down about everything. But my guess is that most of you tend to think of the Old Testament as full of some really interesting but largely irrelevant stories. That are, they're, uh, at least if they are relevant, it's hard to figure out how they are relevant. Like, I'm not really sure what this has to do with my life. I mean, except for the great Proverbs, which, of course, we can memorize the Proverbs and learn how to be wise. Or The Psalms are really great for teaching us how to express our emotions, for example. Um, at least a few of them are. Most of them are super confusing, actually. You like to dash your baby's heads against the rocks. You know, I'll express that emotion. <laughs> but, and let's not, let's not talk about the Song of Solomon. You know, I think, actually, I think... 
that that would be an excellent winter retreat uh, <laughs> series. The Song of Solomon. Keep us all nice and warm, right? Maybe get a few of y'all married and stuff. That'd be good. Put a word in. But man, when it comes to the New Testament, that's where it's at. The New Testament. The New Testament, that's where all the good and all the useful stuff is. That's where I spend all of my time reading because I know what to do with it. It feels like it's speaking directly to my life, how to be a good Christian, how to get to know Jesus better, how to grow in the faith. I mean, like, uh, why is it even called the Old Testament? Like, it's old. Do Do we even need to use it? Do we need it anymore? The, the, all the good stuff's in the New Testament. Doesn't new mean better? What's up, with, what's up with all of that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this weekend. Some of you might know that the word testament is the same concept or the same word as the word covenant. Are you familiar with that idea? A covenant. You know, we use this word today still in very few places. One of them is, um, one of them is in like uh, somebody's will. Have you ever heard about somebody having a will? The formal title for that is a last will and testament. It's a, co- it's a covenant. Here's the way I want this to go. Covenant, it's kind of like a contract. That's probably the closest thing we have to it. There's some significant differences between contracts and covenants. But if you're thinking about a, what is a covenant and you think about contract, that's, um, that's, about, that's about as good as we can do kind of in our modern understanding. There is one, there is one, um, there's one analogy that's actually better um, I'll get to that in a minute. I wanted to say that, that the Bible, so, so covenant, testament means covenant. So we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, which means we have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's the same thing. When you read the word Old Testament, think Old Covenant. When you read the new, word New Testament, think New Covenant. Okay? In fact, there are six covenants in the Bible, six of them. Six major covenants. And these covenants, turns out, provide the backbone and the framework on which the whole structure of the Bible is constructed. The way all these 66 books fit together is that they describe the plan of God for mankind as that plan unfolds through history through these six major covenants. And these covenants, they build on each other. Really, you could say it's a single plan and a single covenant that, uh, that as history goes on, new details are added to it or new parts of the plan are revealed. God has one plan for all of mankind, and he's unveiling that plan as history goes on. And he, un- and he does it through these six covenants. God developed this whole plan before he created anything. And he said, this is how it's going to go down. And there's a reason that he developed it that way. What we have in this book, this Bible, this library, is not just a collection of random stories that all just happen to be about God and man that we kind of cherry pick interesting stuff out of where some of it's useful and some of it's not. Instead, all of the stories in here are directly related to each other through the framework of these six covenants. And as we look at this whole book through the lens of those six covenants, the unfolding plan of God starts to come into focus. And as I was preparing this for you all this weekend, I I thought and I told my wife, boy, I wish I had this when I was 20. I wish I would have had this understanding for the last 22 years of my life. It would have solved so many questions for me. It would have made so many things about the Bible click into place so much better. I would have had shelves to put information about the Bible on as I went instead of having all these random pieces of information floating around in my head. And it's a good thing that God created me to be okay with lots of random pieces of information floating around in my head because they got to hang out there until I saw this idea of the covenants. I I didn't like make it up. I read lots and lots and lots and lots. Turns out people have been talking about this for centuries, and I just was never introduced to it until a few years ago. And I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. God's plan that he unveils over the course of the entire scriptures, throughout the course of thousands of years of history, his whole plan that he is unfolding to people is to reveal himself to his creation, mostly to his people so that we can know him and be in relationship with him. 
What is a covenant? A covenant is all about relationship. There's a definition I read. I think this is a really good definition. You don't need to write this down. Just listen. A covenant is an enduring agreement which defines a relationship between two parties involving a solemn binding obligation or obligations specified on the part of at least one of the parties toward the other, possibly both to each other, made under oath by the threat of divine curse. That's what a covenant is. A covenant is an enduring agreement which defines a relationship between two parties involving a solemn binding set of obligations specified on the part of at least one of the parties toward the other, made by oath under the threat of divine curse. Covenants are all about relationships. The best illustration that we have for what this is, and it's a good illustration because it was designed by God for this purpose, is marriage. Marriage is a covenant. You need to know that. Marriage is a covenant designed by God for the purpose of revealing his relationship to his people. Marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman for life, and its purpose is to help us understand the relationship God's people can have with him, and in the process of that marriage will help us to grow personally, will help us to find joy in life, and will help us to propagate the human race. That's the purpose of marriage. Turns out, that's also the purpose of the biblical covenants, to help us grow, help us find joy, and help us propagate the human race, all to the glory of God. That's the purpose. And the, so, so here's the thing with covenants, and this is the subtext under this question, the subtitle. There's a basic structure to the kind of covenant that these six covenants are, okay? So there's different kinds of contracts out there, right? There might be a contract for a lease on a house. There might be a contract for a loan on a car. There might be a contract for business partners doing business together. There's different kinds of contracts. Of the six covenants that are in the Bible, they're all the same kind of covenant. And the structure that they follow is that they each have a prologue, they each define a set, they define the relationship through a set of promises or grants, is one way of saying it. Here's what I will do for you. By the way, the prologue, I forgot. The prologue is saying, here's why I have the right to make this covenant with you. The prologue says, I have, here's why I have the right to make this covenant with you. The, the grants or the relationship or the promises part says, what I am going to do for you. And the obligations are what you must do to keep those things. And the consequences are what happens if you break this covenant. This is a covenant that was known in the ancient Near East. There won't be a quiz. You don't need to know this. But it was a suzerain grant treaty. That's the technical term. If you ever look this up in a technical theology book, that's what you'll see. In the ancient Near Eastern world, people would have been familiar with this style of covenant with this style of contract. It happened all the time between warring nation states. One nation would be under attack by a stronger nation, or they would just have been trounced by a strong nation. And a stronger still king would come in and say, I can rescue you if we make a covenant. And that's a really interesting fact that it is the exact kind of thing that Moses records God doing through these six covenants. The six covenants in the Bible, they are the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, and then the new covenant. And this is going to be the structure of our weekend. Tonight I'm going to talk about the covenant with Adam and Noah. Tomorrow morning I'm going to talk about the covenant with Abraham and Moses and David. And tomorrow night and Sunday morning I'm going to talk about the new covenant. So I have this wacky chart, and it's a little hard to see, and I apologize for the design of this. Um, I designed this for kind of a, like a more standard size screen. Some of you can make that out. This is what the covenants look like when they're charted out. Isn't this perfectly clear and easy to understand right now? Yes, good, okay. By the end of the conference, you will know what's going on here, what is going on with this chart. And I promise that in the process, I'm gonna try to not be like this guy. But <laughs> the odds are that I might be. Some of my friends tell me that this meme was made about me. Back to the chart. I want to say, too, that um, because 
uh, it's important. I'm going to say this to you real quick, um, and I'm almost done with my prologue, <laughs> um, because it's important for you to know <laughs> my five-page prologue. <laughs> because it's important for you to know that there is some debate out there in the world about how these six covenants fit together. Okay. In fact, I, I understand there's a number of different kinds of churches here tonight. I'm really excited about that. In fact, I'm welcome. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're with us at the Campus Fellowship Fall Retreat. Some, there is some debate about exactly whether there are six covenants. Some, some uh, different theologies say there are seven covenants, as a matter of fact. Some say there are fewer than six, so more or less. I'm going to just try, I'm going to admit to you up front that I have a view that I hold that I'm going to teach you that I'm going to teach you from the perspective of. My goal is not to get you to all, like, to brainwash you into believing my view. My goal is to go through the entire structure of the story of the Bible. That's my goal. I'm going to do it through this structure. Um, and I want to say that it, um, this view that I'm going to unpack, uh, many of our pastors and our churches hold. Um, and, the view, and this view is the one that my studies, as I've done this over the course of the last 20-odd 20, 20 years, um, this view makes the most sense of the Bible the, to me. Um, the six covenants, part of a whole one big storyline, um, and they all add to the, uh, they all add to the, uh, they build on each other for a purpose. That purpose leading us to Jesus, so that we can know God in Christ, so that all those who share in Abraham's faith in God will be saved by grace through faith in the promised Messiah, who turns out to be Jesus. That's my view. And that's what I'm going to teach you. There is another view that believes that, that God has two separate plans for two separate people. Uh, this view would say that God has one plan for Israel and another for the Gentiles. And then in our present day, he has somewhat put the nation of Israel on pause and is dealing with the Gentiles right now. We're in sort of a parenthetical period, they call it. And eventually he's going to get back to Israel. I don't believe that. I think actually that... Um, this does a couple things that are a problem. One is that this view says that the Old Testament is for the Jews, and we don't need to worry about it as Christians. It's largely irrelevant, uh, except for some interesting obscurities about prophecy, about exactly when he's going to get back to the Israelites and things like that. I believe that Romans and Ephesians and Galatians were specifically written so that we wouldn't make the mistake of having this view. By the way, I'm just going to... That was a little harsh. I apologize, but, but this is what I believe. Nevertheless, it's a very popular idea, and many of um, my church background came from this particular view. Uh, my hunch is that some of your pastors hold this view as well, and I'm not trying to dunk on them. I'm just trying to teach the Bible the best way I know how. There's another view out there that's sort of the other extreme, uh, though it's closer to the view that I hold and the, the, the view that I'll be coming from, that holds that God's one unfolding plan does indeed involve all the covenants together. Uh, that I agree with that. And, and um, that faith in Christ is the only thing required for salvation for both Jew and Gentiles. The Bible says that. But I, would believe, I believe uh, it, this other view would go too far in teaching about how applicable the Old Testament law is in the life of believers today. I believe that Romans and Ephesians and Galatians and Hebrews were also written to help us from make, to keep, make, keep us from making that mistake. But since we come from different churches, what I tried to do when I was preparing this is make room for all the views. I think you can listen to what I'm going to say this weekend and fit it into your system if you hold one, and that's okay. I, my whole goal here is to just try to uh, teach you through the whole story of the Bible. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is because for a lot of years I sat under teaching that would say, here's the one view. This is the way it is if you read the Bible literally. All other views don't take the Bible seriously and are stupid. They never said that out loud, <laughs> but that's kind of the attitude behind the teaching. And I just want you to know that there are three, there's actually four, but two of them are very similar, major views, and I hold one of them. And that's, I'm just going to admit that up front, let the buyer beware, okay? <laughs> I just want to use it as a framework for telling you about the greatest story ever told. So let's go, all right? As I mentioned, covenants are all about relationship. The features of the biblical covenants, there are a certain set of relational promises, grants made, and those promises have to do with God promising, God promising his people a God. In fact, he promises him, himself that he will be with them, God with us. He promises God with us. He promises a people, 
that sounds weird. Basically, I'm going to promise you a heritage. I'm going to promise you a clan, a nation. Uh, I'm going to play up. He promises them a place, home. Where is home? And he promises them a king. All of the six major covenants have these features to them. There's, a, there's, a, there's another feature, a fifth feature. It's a common feature to all the covenants as well, but I couldn't fit it on the chart. <laughs> and that is that all six of these covenants are intended to have a global impact. All of these covenants, though they are made with specific people or specific people groups, are for all of mankind. Okay? They all have a global impact, and we'll talk about that as we go. So the first covenant, let's get into it. The covenant with Adam, the beginning. Where did this all start? And I want to set the stage. I'm going to, do, I'm going to follow the same format, roughly, for each covenant. I'm going to give you the context of the covenant first. And it starts in Genesis 1. So open your Bible all the way to the very beginning, the very first page. Genesis chapter 1. Some of you could probably say this verse without even looking at it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The context of the covenant with Adam is creation. The situation into which Adam was set was chaos and emptiness. The earth was formless. It was chaotic is another word for that. And it was empty. Chaos and emptiness was the context of this covenant. Chaos and emptiness is not a very habitable place for people to live, is it? If you went to a place that is completely chaotic and has nothing in it, well, you by definition wouldn't be able to be there because you would be a something in the nothing. What did God do? I'm not going to read all of these verses, but God spends the next six days bringing form to the form or bringing order to the chaos. And then he fills the emptiness. He made light and he separated it from the dark. So out of the chaos, he made light and he separated it. He brought order to light and dark. He separated waters from the heavens, the waters from the waters, some versions say. He brought order to all of this swirling watery depth. He made waters for the sky and waters for the ground. And then he separated the sea and the dry land. He brought order to the swirling chaos by bringing dry land. And he said, this far the water shall come and no further. And then he filled the lands with plants. He filled the heaven with lights. He filled the sky with birds and the oceans with fish and the dry land with animals. Not exactly in that order. I think I got that kind of out of order. And then he makes a covenant with Adam. Then God said, let us make man in our image. This is verse 26. According to our likeness, they will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. And God blessed them and God said to them, here it is, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls in the earth. And God said, look, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed, these will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and every other creature that crawls in the earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given the green plants for food. And it was so. And God said all that he had made, and it was very good Indeed, evening came and then morning, the sixth day. And then I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, because there's a piece here we need to pick up. Chapter 2, 15, the Lord God took the man, the Adam, in Hebrew it says, the Lord God took the Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in this entire garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you will die. Warning, Adam. Now look at this command. Go go back to verse 28. God's first command to men, mankind. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls in the earth. That's an interesting command. 
This is the first covenant that he makes. Is this a harsh command? When you think of the commandments of God, what do you think of? Do you typically think of like, well, that's no fun. When you think of obeying God, do you typically think, ah, oh, that's kind of a, ah, oh, that's really hard, and I would rather not. Sometimes I wish he wouldn't command things. Is this a harsh command? Be a king. Have lots of babies. Fill this earth. That's not very harsh. All right, God, I guess if I have to. Be kings and queens. Thrive. Flourish. That's my command to you. You know what else? You know what God's commands are like? This one is very typical of all of them. You know what he's saying with his commands? Be kings and queens. He says, rule over it, subdue it, have dominion over it, some translations say. He's saying, be like me. I give you all of this. Now be like me. That's, a, that's kind of a risky command for a king to give, isn't it? I'm going to give you all this stuff, and you be king over it. You be kings and queens over it. I want to tell you, you might not believe me on this right away, but I will tell you that life will make more sense the Bible will make more sense if you understand that every single one of God's commands in the scriptures are like that. Be like me. Be like God. That's what he's telling Adam and Eve, which is why it's so interesting. We'll get to the fall in a second. The serpent deceives Eve and says, did he really say not to eat that tree? You know what? You know why he doesn't want to eat you that tree? Because he knows that when you eat that tree, you'll be like God. You know what Eve should have said to the serpent? What are you talking about? I already am. That's what he asked me to do, be like him. Let's get to the structure that I was talking about earlier, the prologue of this covenant. The prologue, why does God have the right to make this covenant. What does he say? Verse 27. Next slide. Sorry, I, I should have deleted that one. There it is. God created man in his own image. The basis that the Bible gives for God's right to make a covenant with mankind and give them commands is, I created you. <laughs> You're mine. That's the basis that God gives for his right to make a covenant with people. I created you. You're mine. One way of reading this, and it's gonna, you'll see this is a little poetic, actually, the way the Bible does it. Adam, I brought you out of the earth. This language of I brought you out of is going to be a recurring theme in all six covenants. I brought you out of the chaos and the emptiness and the dirt, and I put my spirit in you. That's the basis why God has the right. And what are the grants? What are the promises that God gives Adam here? Well, first of all, the, this grid again that we set up, they're all alike. Here's how this fills in with Adam and Eve. God promises them that God will be with us. He says, I will be watching. I'm going to walk with you in the garden. That's how I'm going to be with you. He gives them a place, namely the entire earth. It's all yours. Where's your place? Where's your promised land? We're going to pick that word up. It's the whole thing. Who's going to be your people? All the people. <laughs> Who are the people that are promised to Adam and Eve? All of them. Uh, when we get to some of the further commandments we'll, or further covenants, we'll see it gets more specific over time. But for Adam and Eve, it's all of them. Who's the king here? They get to be a race of kings and queens under God. And the global impact that happens, basically all mankind comes from them. That's how it impacts everybody. And um, they have just one obligation. So we talked about a prologue, grants or promises. Obligations, don't eat from that one tree. Consequence, if you break the covenant, you'll die. That's why I don't want you to eat from it. You'll die. Another thing I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about the scope of the covenants, and that's where our chart comes in, back to our wacky chart. 
Okay, I'm going to simplify this for you just for the sake of where we're at so far in the story. Just this one slide. Adam, just this one um, next slide. The scope of this covenant is... Basically, the covenant with Adam is the only thing in play right now. And it's in play for all the people. The black on that chart, that's the nothingness. <laughs> uh, and, and if you can't read, it goes from creation to new creation. So that's all, that's all the people throughout all the time. That's what that yellow square means. All people from the beginning of creation until the end, including us today, are under and affected by the covenant with Adam. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over it. How did that go for them? Here's the thing about the Bible. We get to see how that went. How did that go for them? This is a question I'm going to ask of all of the covenants. Genesis 3 describes a nearly immediate fall into sin, and we're going to see this is a repeating pattern throughout the scriptures as well. And the Bible doesn't describe a period of happiness and flourishing for Adam and Eve. They were created, they were put in the garden. Adam names all the animals, finds Eve, and the next thing that happens is they are tempted and fall into sin. Sometimes I've, I've played the game of like, I wonder how long they lasted. Like, 30 minutes? Maybe they lasted a couple hours. Did that thing with the Satan, the serpent, did that happen like the first day? We just don't know. How did this go for them? They're nearly immediate fall into sin. They break the one rule. They break the one rule. They had a whole earth full of a billion yeses. You can have anything to eat in this entire planet with one exception. Don't eat from that tree because if you eat this, you'll die. That's why I don't want you to eat it. You'll die. What's the first thing the Bible records them doing? Eating from the tree. Don't push this shiny red button right here. Don't, don't push it. How many of you are visualizing a shiny red button and somehow kind of like want to press it now, right? Yeah, I saw some raised hands. That's our problem. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to push that button. And this one violation brings the whole curse of sin. They're expelled from the garden. Notice this. God says, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They eat of it, they do not die immediately. There's a theme here. God withholds his judgment and he instead extends mercy and grace. Instead of Adam and Eve immediately dying, we have on record the first animal sacrifice in the Bible. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. The Lord God made clothing from the skins, from skins of animals for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. It's the first recorded animal death in the Bible used to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. The Lord God said, since man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and take from the tree of life and, live, and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. We could talk for hours about the significance of all of this, but they were expelled from the garden. Why? Why would, this, why would it be so bad for Adam and Eve to live forever in this state now? God said, we don't want that to happen, so I'm going to kick them out of the garden. Is he just being mean and vengeful? Is God being mean and vengeful here? Sometimes I read the Old Testament and I'm tempted to think, this seems like an emotional overreaction. Well, now they don't get to live forever. But here's the deal. God is not emotionally overreactive. He is good and he is merciful and he knows what's best. And he knows that there are fates worse than death. Death gives rise to the potential for resurrection later. But how terrible would it be to live forever with your guilt and your sin? That would be like hell. So what does he do instead? He allows them to die. The ground is cursed. Their sin brings a curse that affects every single aspect of their life. We talked about this on Sunday 
at Stonebrook, but it affects marriage and family. It affects everybody's work. It affects our relationship with God. It affects home, family, church, and work. That's like all of the things. But in here, in chapter 3, verse 15, there is also a promise. We're going to find this in every how did that go for them as well. There is a promise. Verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He says this to the serpent. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Um, Theologians have called this the proto-evangelion. I didn't pronounce that correctly. But it means the proto-gospel. This snake is going to die. It's the first hint of deliverance from our enemy, the liar, the serpent. Sin entered the world as our first parents believed the snake over their good loving, the good loving promise of their creator, and sin affects everything. Now we're going to fast forward a few generations, just three chapters forward in your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Here's where we end up. This is how humanity does under this amazing promise in this amazing paradise with a whole world full of a billion yeses and only one no. How do we do with that? Well, look. God looks down at the earth and what does he see? A few generations later. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was very great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is a pretty emphatic verse. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Are human beings mostly good? Are we like innately good and we just have a few bad traits? No. Every intention of the thought of your heart is only evil continually. That's where we ended up just a few generations from paradise. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot man out whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of heaven, for I am sorry I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And it is this context that God makes his second covenant. The context for Adam and Eve was chaos and emptiness. The context for Noah was the wickedness of man on the earth was very great and every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And what does he do? He makes his covenant with Noah. He reboots creation. He reboots creation. Genesis 7 shows God rescuing Noah and his family and, every, and a few of every kind of animal into this ark, this place of safety that's going to be able to float on the flood waters and he wipes out all the rest of creation with a massive, global, catastrophic, gushing flood, water erupting up from the earth and pouring down from the heavens. It's never rained. The Bible never describes rain up to this point. And by the way, I don't think that the, the flood was about rain. I think there was something going on with waters gushing out of the skies like no one has ever seen before or since. It was coming up from the ground and gushing down from the skies. It flooded the entire earth. But Noah and his family and a few of every kind of animal were saved Genesis chapter 8 shows the flood's waters subsiding, by the way, in a pattern that matches the seven days of creation. I wasn't taught that in Sunday school. Were you taught that in Sunday school? Chapter chapter 8, the first thing that happens in creation on day one is that God's spirit is hovering over the water. The word for spirit in Hebrew is the same as breath or wind. And in chapter 8, we find a wind blowing over the water. (laughs) It matches The second thing that happens is that the separation of the sky and the waters, he shuts the waters of the heavens up and stops the deluge from below, separating the water from the sky. The dry ground appears from the water next. The next thing that happens is that birds appear in the sky and there's a raven and a dove flying. The next thing that happens is that all the creatures come onto the land. The next thing that happens is the mankind shows up on the land. Mankind, in fact, is called the image of God here again. And then the last thing that happens is the exact same blessing. Look at chapter nine, verse, or sorry, sorry, chapter eight, verse twenty-one. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of Noah's offering, Noah was very thankful to be out of the ark finally, and so he made an offering. 
when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said to himself, I will never again do this. I'm never going to curse the ground because of human beings, even though, underline this verse, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. It's a very important point. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, they will not cease. God promises the natural order will continue. God blessed Noah and his sons. See if this sounds familiar. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Ah, That sounds familiar. The next thing that happens to Adam and Eve is he says, I give you every green plant. The covenant with Noah is better. They get to eat meat. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth. Every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls in the ground, and all the fish of the sea, they are placed under your authority. That sounds right. Rule over them. Same promise. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, so I give you everything. We get to eat steak now. Yes. Amen. Amen. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. Here's the restriction on the thing you can't eat. That sounds familiar too, right? Don't eat meat with its lifeblood in it. And I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed. For God made humans in his image. But you, here it is again, be fruitful, multiply, spread out over the earth, Okay, check that command. Maybe underline that. That's coming into play tomorrow. Spread out over the earth and multiply on it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living thing, every living creature. And it goes on. Here we have the covenant with Noah, which is a reiteration of the covenant with Adam. God says, that covenant that I had with Adam and Eve and all the rest of their people... Everyone that everyone spurned, that nobody paid attention to, and by the time I got to you, every thought and intention of everybody's heart was nothing but evil all the time. That covenant I made with Adam and Eve, I'm giving it to you now. It's the same covenant. There are some theologies that will say there are seven covenants, and what happens is God sets up a covenant and man fails, and God goes, ah. So now we have to try again. Next covenant. Ah, man failed again. Ah. This is God. So I need a third covenant. Try that. Man feel. That's not what happens. God is expanding his covenant. The prologue, let's go to the details. The prologue of this covenant. God spoke to Noah and said, come out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your wives with you. This is not immediately obvious that this is a prologue. What is he saying? Hey, guys, I just brought you out of the flood. I brought you out of the ark. I just saved you from destruction. So for Adam and Eve, it was, I created you. For Noah and his family, it was, I saved you from destruction. That's why I have the right to make this covenant with you. What are the stipulations of this covenant? What are the promises? Well, God with us. There's a little detail in here. He promises the same thing he promised Adam. I will be with you. He gives a little detail that he will dwell in Shem's tent. That's a little foreshadowing. Is that Manhattan? Say it one more time. Welcome. Everybody say hello. Glad you're with us. It's going to be confusing for a little bit. We're almost done, though. The place that God promises Noah, like with Adam, it's the entire earth. He's starting over. The people that he promises Noah, like with Adam, it's all the people are going to come from Noah now. By the way, if anybody ever asks you if you have relatives in common, you do. (laughs) Noah and his family. (laughs) You are related all the way back at Noah. All the people from all, uh, all the people in the world came from Noah and his family. And a king, again, mankind, a race of kings under God. These are all placed under your authority, he told Noah. And the global impact, again, all the people came from him. And just like, just like with Adam, the promise, there's a promise here, I will never again wipe out the earth by flood waters. Not going to do that ever again. Here's a little Easter egg that's fun with Noah. 
a little bit of a spoiler for what this all means for all of us. We are in need of a rescuer. Noah's name sounds like the Hebrew word for relief or rest or rescue. That's pretty cool. There's an obligation with the covenant. Just like I said, there's a prologue, there's the grants, there's the obligations. What's the obligation? For Adam and Eve, it was don't eat the fruit. For Noah, it's don't eat blood. And also don't murder people. You can have steak now, but you can't kill people. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> the consequence, the consequence of breaking this covenant of eating blood or killing people is death. And the day you kill a person, your blood will be required. Very similar to Adam and Eve. The scope of the covenant, back to our wacky chart. This one's just, okay, it's getting simpler. We're starting with our chart. There's Adam. The, uh, again, the scope of this is with all mankind. Everybody that's left, i.e. just Noah and his family and all of their descendants. So everyone on the planet to this day is also under the covenant with Noah. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, have authority over the plants and the animals, and don't kill people. Interesting, there's an addition here. There's the sign of the covenant. Um, there's a sign for all of the covenants. Some people, there's not really a sign for the covenant of Adam. Some people try to make up a sign so that it fits this grid nicely. And I'm just going to say there's not really one. The sign for the covenant is found in Genesis 9, 12 through 17. You all, uh, those of you who had Sunday school, who grew up in Sunday school, learned that the rainbow is the sign of the covenant, right? Interesting fact. There is no Hebrew word for rainbow. Did you know that? There's no Hebrew word for rainbow. There is a Hebrew word for an archer's bow. And it's specifically a battle bow, not a hunting bow. What did God do? He said, he said, I am putting my bow in the clouds. What does that mean? I'm not aiming at you anymore in judgment. I'm putting it up. Never again going to destroy the earth. This is my promise. My bow is not at you anymore. It's now in the clouds. In fact, that bow is aiming at himself, isn't it? The next time I judge sin, I'm the one that gets the bow. A little prophecy built in. It's kind of fun. A little, little Easter egg. All right. Last thing. So that was his, that was his deal. I'm going to reboot creation. I'm going to give you all a second chance. I'm going to give you paradise again, this time with steak. How's it going to go? Well, Noah immediately sets about disobeying God's commands. The next thing that's recorded is a lot of shenanigans with his family. There was something with him getting drunk and something that's going on with his sons, uncovering his nakedness and you know, telling each other about it. It's a little complex. Don't have time to go there. But the big idea is that sin survived the flood. It came with Noah and his family on the ark. This core problem remains. God set it up this way on purpose. With all six of these covenants, he's teaching us about ourselves. There is a problem that needs to be solved. Sin survived the flood because it's in our hearts. And just two chapters later, we're fast-forwarding through generations again. We see how this ends up. All of the people that came from Adam and Eve, their, their, every thought and intention of their heart was nothing but evil all day, so God started over. We're just a couple generations from Noah, and what do we see? Go to chapter 11, verse 1. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. And as people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. So what was God's command to, to Noah and his family? Spread out over the earth. What did they end up doing? We're going to find this one place. In verse 3, they said to each other, come, let's make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. New technology, yay. And they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower and a tower with its top in the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we would be scattered throughout the earth, which is exactly what God commanded them to do, scattered throughout the earth. And they don't want to do that. Then the Lord looked down over the city and to the tower that the humans were building, and the Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. It's the same kind of judgment that you know what? 
If I let them stay here, they're going to live forever. That sounds good, doesn't it? Living forever? Why does God consider that a bad idea? Well, this sounds good. Nothing they, do, no, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. That sounds good, right? Why is this a problem? So he says, come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that no one will understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them throughout the earth and they stopped building their city and they called it Babylon. What are the things that the people were trying to do with building the tower? By the way, it's the Tower of Babylon. I grew up, we grew up, probably most of us grew up calling it the Tower of Babel. There's no reason for that. It's the exact same word as the word Babylon everywhere else in the Bible. So we should just say, it's the Tower of Babylon. <laughs> but we have the English word Babel. And so we like to keep it that way because they ended up babbling, babble, babble, babble. They couldn't understand each other. It's called Babylon for the Lord confused their languages and from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. What were they trying to do with building this tower? They were trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to protect themselves and they were trying to ignore God. So why is it a bad thing that nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them? Well, the problem again is sin. Nothing these people pl try, that plan to do in their sin is going to be impossible for them. That's a really bad situation. God, here's what God is doing. God, as he's done since then to now, he is restraining people from being as evil as they could be. Does that make sense? There are some really evil people out there. But they're not as evil as they might be if God were not restraining them. This is really good news. So in order to keep them from being as evil as they might be, he scatters them out. It's like he takes this fire and he kicks it and he spreads the embers out. Because if that fire were allowed to continue, it would burn everybody alive. If there were a single hierarchical human authority ruling over everyone, it would be as crushing for the people on the bottom of that social structure as if that entire tower collapsed down upon them. That tower was built on the backs of slaves. It would be really great for the people who got to live at the top of the tower. It would be really horrible for the people who were used to build that tower and build the nice life for the people at the top. Does that sound familiar, by the way? God is also accomplishing his mission of filling the earth with image bearers. So from these two covenants, covenant with Adam, covenant with Noah, what do we learn about God? What do we see here? We're going to wrap with this. I'm almost done. That God is powerful and creative and good and he deserves and he desires, sorry, God desires us to thrive and have joy. That's what we see. What was his covenant with Adam? What was his covenant with Noah? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Eat steak <laughs> for you vegetarians. You can have all the plants. <laughs> what else do we see? We see that we see that he's merciful. That both for both Adam and Noah, he didn't immediately visit the full consequence of their sin on them. He didn't even do that with the the Babylonians. Third, we see that he has a plan to rescue us. And that plan to rescue us starts with showing us our problem. What's our problem? What do we learn about ourselves? We learn first that we are creatures. We are created by a creator. We are just clay. He's the potter. Does the potter have no right over the clay to say, I'm going to make you like this? We learn that we belong to God. He made us. We also learn that we have the capacity for great evil. And to left, to our own con our, left to our own devices, that's exactly what we're going to do. That's what we see in these first two covenants. Left to our own devices, what do we do? Evil. Without God guiding us and directing us, what is the thing we do? Evil. Every inclination of our heart is toward evil from our youth. That is a true statement about you and about me, about our natural heart. That's getting at the solution to the problem tomorrow night. The problem is our heart. How do we know that? 
Because given perfect paradise, we choose the one no. Given the second chance with that perfect paradise and this time with steak, we still rebel. I've had so many conversations with people over the years who think that God is not fair. If I had the opportunity that Adam had, I would do better. And let me just assure you tonight, this is the final point. No, you wouldn't. Let's pray. If you found this encouraging, we hope you'll subscribe or follow for more content. Or go to our website, campusfellowship.com, for other resources. Campus Fellowship is a student organization whose goal is to come alongside local churches to reach college campuses. Thanks for listening.